Hey everybody, I'm Joey Haber from the Flying Tortoise Academy in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to the 15th video in the series, I think. Um, today we're going to break apart line 8, the final line of the Bagua Linear 64 Palms. We're going to take a look at all the little pieces, dissect them, and have some fun. We're also going to do some work with hip opening, um, T2 kicking drills, of course, our hip rolling, and all that good stuff. If you have any questions, comments, or requests, please let me know, and I will try to accommodate. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. I simply slept at night on Mars while Mindy had to drift 40 minutes forward every day, taping aluminum foil to her windows to get any sleep at all. She brought up the most recent satellite images. She cocked an eyebrow. He had not broken camp yet. Usually he drove in the early morning, as soon as it was light enough to navigate. Then he capitalized on the midday sun to maximize recharging. But today he had not moved. And it was well past morning. She checked around the rovers and the bedroom for a message. She found it in the usual place, north of the campsite. As she read the Morse code, her eyes widened. Dust storm, making plan. Fumbling with her cell phone, she dialed Beckett's personal number. Chapter 23. and it was 97% of optimal. So right now, it's a 3% storm. I need to make progress, and I need to regenerate oxygen. Those are my two main goals. I use 20% of my overall power to reclaim oxygen when I stop for air days. If I end up in an 81% part of the storm, I'll be in real trouble. I'll run out of oxygen even if I dedicate all available power to producing it. That's the fatal scenario. But really... It's fatal much earlier than that. I need power to move, or I'll be stranded until the storm passes or dissipates. That could be months. The more power I generate, the more I'll have for movement. With clear skies, I dedicate 80% of my total power toward movement. I get 90 kilometers per sol this way. So right now, at 3% loss, I'm getting 2.7 kilometers less than I should. It's okay to lose some driving distance per sol. I have plenty of time but I can't let myself get too deep in the storm or I'll never be able to get out. At the very least, I need to travel faster than the storm. If I can go faster, I can maneuver around it without being enveloped. So I need to find out how fast it's moving. I can do that by sitting here for a soul. I can compare tomorrow's wattage to today's. All I have to do is make sure to compare at the same times of day. Then I'll know how fast the storm is moving, at least in terms of percent power loss but I need to know the shape of the storm, too. Dust storms are big. They can be thousands of kilometers across. So when I work my way around it, I'll need to know which way to go. I want to move perpendicular to the storm's movement and in whatever direction has less storm. So here's my plan. Right now, I can go 86 kilometers because I couldn't get a full battery yesterday. Tomorrow, I'm going to leave a solar cell here and drive 40 kilometers due south. Then I'll drop off another solar cell and drive another 40 kilometers. Hit south. circles? That'll give me three points of reference across 80 kilometers. The next day I'll go back to collect the cells and get the data. By comparing the wattage at the same time of day in those three locations, I'll learn the shape of the storm. If the storm is thicker to the south, I'll go north to get around it. If it's thicker north, I'll go south. I'm hoping to go south. Schiaparelli is southeast of me. Going north would add a lot of time to my total trip. There's one slight problem with my plan. I don't have any way to record the wattage from an abandoned solar cell. I can easily track and log wattage with the rover computer, but I need something I can drop off and leave behind. I can't just take readings as I drive along. I need readings at the same time in different places. So I'm going to spend today working on some mad science. I have to make something that can log wattage, something I can leave behind with a single solar cell. 
Since I'm stuck here for the day anyway, I'll leave the solar cells out. I may as well get a full battery out of it. Log entry. Soul 477. It took all day yesterday and today, but I think I'm ready to measure this storm. I needed a way to log the time of day and the wattage of each solar cell. One of the cells would be with me, but the other two would be dropped off and left far away. Right leg, external rotation. Extra EVA suit I brought along. EVA suits have cameras recording everything they see. There's one on the right arm, or the left if the astronaut is left-handed, and another above the faceplate. A timestamp is burned into the lower left corner of the image, just like on the shaky home videos Dad used to take. My electronics kit has several power meters, so I figured, why make my own logging system? I can just film the power meter all day long. So that's what I set up. When I packed for this road trip, I made sure to bring all my kits and tools, just in case I had to repair the rover en route. First, I harvested the cameras from my spare EVA suit. I had to be careful. I didn't want to ruin the suit. It's my only spare. I extracted the cameras and the lines leading to their memory chips. I put a power meter into a small sample container, then glued a camera to the underside of the lid. When I sealed up the container, the camera was properly recording the readout of the power meter. For testing, I used rover power. How will my logger get power once I abandon it on the surface? It'll be attached to Left a leg. square meter solar cell. That'll provide plenty of power. And I put a small rechargeable battery in the container to tide it over during nighttime. Again, harvested from the spare EVA suit. The next problem was heat, or the lack thereof. As soon as I take this thing out of the rover, it'll start cooling down mighty fast. If it gets too cold, the electronics will stop working. So I needed a heat source, and my electronics kit provided the answer. Resistors. Lots and lots of them. Resistors heat up. It's what they do. The camera and the power meter only need a tiny fraction of what a solar cell can make, so the rest of the energy goes through resistors. I made and tested two power loggers and confirmed that the images were being properly recorded. Then I had an EVA. I detached two of my solar cells and hooked them up to the power loggers. I let them log happily for an hour, then brought them back in to check the results. Figure eight. Worked great. It's getting toward nightfall now. Tomorrow morning I'll leave one power logger behind and head south. While I was working, I left the oxygenator going. Why not? So I'm all stocked up on O2 and good to go. The solar cell efficiency for today was 92.5%, compared to yesterday's 97%. This proves the storm is moving east to west, because the denser part of the storm was to the east yesterday. So right now, the sunlight in this area is dropping by 4.5% per sol. If I were to stay here another 16 sols, it would get dark enough to kill me. Just as well I'm not going to stay here. Log entry. Sol 478. Everything went as planned today. No hiccups. I can't tell if I'm driving deeper into the storm or out of it. It's hard to tell if the ambient light is less or more than it was yesterday. The human brain works hard to abstract that. Right hip, internal rotation. I left a power logger behind when I started out. Then, after 40 kilometers travel due south, I had a quick EVA to set up another. Now I've gone the full 80 kilometers, set up my solar cells for charging, and I'm logging the wattage. Tomorrow I'll have to reverse course and pick up the power loggers. It may be dangerous. I'll be driving right back into a known storm area. But the risk is worth the game. Also, have I mentioned I'm sick of potatoes? Because by God, I am sick of potatoes. If I ever return to Earth, I'm going to buy a nice little home in Western Australia. Because Western Australia is on the opposite side of Earth from Idaho. I bring it up because I dined on a meal pack today. I had saved five packs for special occasions. I ate the first of them 29 souls ago when I left for Schiaparelli, but I totally forgot to eat the second when I reached the halfway point a few souls ago. So I'm enjoying my belated halfway feast. It's probably more accurate to eat it today anyway. Who knows how long it'll take me to go around this storm. And if I end up stuck in the storm and doomed to die, I'm totally eating the other earmarked meals. Log entry. Soul 479. Have you ever taken the wrong freeway entrance? 
You just need to drive to the next exit to turn around. But you hate every inch of travel because you're going away from your goal. I felt like that all day. I'm now back where I started yesterday morning. Yuck. Along the way, I picked up the power locker I'd left behind at the halfway point. Just now, I brought in the one I'd left here yesterday. Both loggers worked the way I'd hoped. I downloaded each of their video recordings to a laptop and advanced them to noon. Finally, I had solar efficiency readings from three locations along an 80-kilometer line, all from the same time of day. As of noon yesterday, the northernmost loggers showed 12.3% efficiency loss, the middle one had a 9.5% loss, and the rover recorded a 6.4% loss at its southern location. It paints a pretty clear picture. The storm's north of me, and I already worked out it's traveling west, so I should be able to avoid it by heading south a ways, letting it pass me to the north, then heading east again. Finally, some good news. Southeast is what I wanted. I won't lose much time. Sigh. I have to drive the same goddamned path a third time tomorrow. Log entry. Soul 480. I think I'm getting ahead of the storm. Having traveled along Mars Highway 1 all day, I'm back at my campsite from yesterday. Tomorrow, I'll finally make real headway again. I was done driving and had the camp set up by noon. The efficiency loss here is 15.6 percent right. compared to the 17 percent loss at yesterday's right hand raise, this means left I leg raise, the storm as long step, as I keep heading south. Hopefully, rest to scoop, the storm pull, is probably circular. They usually pull, are, but I could just be driving into an alcove. If that's the case, I'm just fucking dead, okay? There's only so much I can do. I'll know soon enough. If the storm is circular, I should get better and better efficiency every day until I'm back to 100%. Once I reach 100%, that means I'm completely south of the storm, and I can start going east again. We'll see. Pull if there were no storm, I'm step. going directly southeast toward my goal. As it is, going only south, I'm not nearly as fast. I'm traveling 90 kilometers per day as usual. But I only get 37 kilometers closer to Schiaparelli because Pythagoras is a dick. I don't know when I'll finally clear the storm and be able to beeline to Schiaparelli again, but one thing's for sure. My plan to arrive on Sol 494 is boned. Sol 549. That's when they come for me. If I miss it, I'll spend the rest of my very short life here. And I still have the MAV to modify before then, too. Sheesh. Log entry. Soul 482. Air day. A time for relaxation and speculation. For relaxation, I read 80 pages of Agatha Christie's Evil Under the Sun, courtesy of Johansson's digital book collection. I think Linda Marshall is the murderer. As for speculation, I speculated on when the hell I'll get past this storm. I'm still going due south every day. Still dealing with efficiency loss, though I'm keeping ahead of it. Every day of this crap, I'm only getting 37 kilometers closer to the MAV instead of 90. Pissing me off. I considered skipping the air day. I could go another couple of days before I ran out of oxygen. And getting away from the storm is pretty important. But I decided against it. I'm far enough ahead of the storm that I can afford one day of no movement. And I don't know if a couple more days would help. Who knows how far south the storm goes? Well, NASA probably knows. And the news stations back on Earth are probably showing it. And there's probably a website like www.watch-mark-watme-die.com. So there's like a hundred million people or so who know exactly how far south it goes. But I'm not one of them. Log entry. Soul 484. Finally. I am finally past the goddamn storm. Today's power regen was 100%. No more dust in the air. With the storm moving perpendicular to my direction of travel, it means I'm south of the southernmost point of the cloud. Presuming it's a okay. circular storm. It's not Hands on knees, block. circles. Starting tomorrow, I can go directly towards Schiaparelli, which is good, because I lost a lot of time. The direction? 540 kilometers due south while avoiding that storm. I'm catastrophically off course. Mind you, it hasn't been that Forward, bad. open, back. I'm well into Terra Meridiani now, and the driving 
is a little easier here than the rugged, ass-kicking terrain of Arabia Terra. Schiaparelli is almost due east, and if my sextant and Phobos calculations are correct, I've got another 1,000... Forward, back, open, together. forward. Accounting for air days and presuming 90 kilometers of travel per Sol, I should arrive on Sol 498. Not too bad, really. The nearly mark-killing storm only ended up delaying me by four souls. I'll still have 44 souls to do Press. whatever MAV modifications Step. NASA has in mind. Log entry. Soul 487. Same side. Interesting opportunity here. And by opportunity, I mean opportunity. I got pushed so far off course, I'm actually not far from the Mars Exploration Rover Opportunity. It's about 300 kilometers away. I could get there in about four souls. Damn, it's tempting. If I could get Opportunity's radio working, I'd be in touch with humanity again. NASA would continually tell me my exact position and best course, warn me if another storm was on its way, and generally be there watching over me. But if I'm being honest, that's not the real reason I'm interested. I'm sick of being on my own, damn it. Once I got Pathfinder working, I got used to talking to Earth. All that went away because I leaned a drill against the wrong table, and now I'm alone again. I could end that in just four souls. But it's an irrational, stupid thought. I'm only 11 souls away from the MAV. Why go out of my way to dig up another broken-ass rover to use as a makeshift radio when I'll have a brand new, fully functional communication system within a couple of weeks? All right. T-Tway. While it's really tempting that I'm within striking range of another rover. Man, we really littered this planet with them, didn't we? It's not the smart move. Besides, I've defiled enough future historical sites for now. Log entry. Soul 492. I need to put some thought into the bedroom. Right now, I can only have it set up when I'm inside the rover. It attaches to the airlock, so I can't get out of it. It's there. During my road trip, that doesn't matter because I have to furl it every day anyway. But once I get to the MAB, I won't have to drive around anymore. Each decompress and recompress of the bedroom stresses the seams. I learned that lesson the hard way when the hat blew up. So it's best if I can find a way to leave it out. Holy shit, I just realized I actually believe I'll get to the MAB. See what I did there? I casually talk about what I'll do after I get to the MAB. Like it was nothing. No big Inside deal. Crescent? I'm just going to pop over to Ski Apparelli and hang with the MAV there. Nice. Anyway, I don't have another airlock. I've got one on the rover and one on the trailer, and that's it. They're firmly fixed in place, so it's not like I can detach one and attach it to the bedroom. But I can seal the bedroom entirely. I don't even have to do any hatchet jobs on it. The airlock attachment point has a flap I can unroll and seal the opening with. Remember, I stole the airlock attachment from a pop tent, which is an emergency feature for pressure loss while in the rover. It'd be pretty useless if it couldn't seal itself off. Unfortunately, as an emergency device, it was never intended to be reusable. The idea was that people seal themselves in the pop tent, then the rest of the crew drives to wherever they are in the other rover and rescues them. The crew of the good rover detaches the pop tent from the breached rover and reattaches it. Outside crescent? Then they cut through the seal from their side to recover their crewmates. To make sure this would always be an option, mission rules dictated no more than three people could be in a rover at once, and both rovers had to be fully functional, or we couldn't use either. So here's my brilliant plan. I won't use the bedroom as a bedroom anymore once I get to the MAV. I'll use it to house the oxygenator and atmospheric regulator. Then I'll use the trailer as my bedroom. Neat, eh? The trailer has tons of space. I put a shitload of work into making that happen. The balloon gives plenty of headroom. Not a lot of floor space, but still lots of vertical area. Also, the bedroom has several valve apertures in its canvas. I have the Habs design to thank for that. The canvas I stole from it has valve apertures, triple redundant ones actually. NASA wanted to make sure the Hab could be refilled from the outside if necessary. Kicking the opposite yeah, shoulder. I'll have the bedroom sealed with the oxygenator and atmospheric regulator inside. It'll be attached to the trailer via hoses to share the same atmosphere, and I'll run a power line through one of the hoses. The rover will serve as storage, because I won't need to get to the driving controls anymore, and the trailer will be completely empty. 
Then I'll have a permanent bedroom. I'll even be able to use it as a workshop for whatever MAV modifications I need to do on parts that can fit through the trailer's airlock. Of course, if the atmospheric regulator or oxygenator have problems, I'll need to cut into the bedroom to get to them. But I've been here 492 souls, and they've worked fine the whole time. So I'll take that risk. Clock entry. Soul 497. I'll be at the entrance to Schiaparelli tomorrow. Presuming nothing goes wrong, that is. But hey, everything else is going smoothly this mission, right? Another sarcasm. Today's an air day. For once, I don't want it. I'm so close to Schiaparelli, I can taste it. I guess it would taste like sand, mostly, but that's not the point. Line eight. Of course, that won't be the end of the trip. It'll take another three souls to get from the entrance to the MAV, but hot damn, I'm almost there. I think I can even see the rim of Schiaparelli. It's way the hell off in the distance, and it might just be my imagination. It's 62 kilometers away, so if I'm seeing it, I'm only just barely seeing it. Tomorrow, once I get to Entrance Crater, I'll turn south and enter the Schiaparelli Basin via the entrance ramp. I did Once some again. back of the napkin map, and the slope should be pretty safe. The elevation change from the rim to the basin is 1.5 kilometers, and the ramp is at least 45 kilometers long. That makes for a 2 degree grade. No problem. Tomorrow night, I'll sink to an all new low. Let me rephrase that. Tomorrow night, I'll be at rock bottom. No, that doesn't sound good either. Tomorrow night, I'll be in Giovanni Schiaparelli's favorite hole. Okay, I admit, I'm just playing around now. For millions of years, the rim of the crater had been under constant attack from wind. It eroded the rocky crest the way a river cuts through a mountain range. After eons, it finally breached the edge. The high pressure zone created by the wind now had an avenue to drain. The breach widened more and more with each passing millennium. As it widened, Dust and sand particles carried along with the attack settled in the basin below. Eventually, a balance point was reached. The sand had piled up high enough to be flush with the land outside the crater. It no longer built upward, but outward. The slope lengthened until a new balance point was reached, one defined by the complex interactions of countless tiny particles and their ability to maintain an angled shape. Entrance ramp had been born. The weather brought dunes and desert terrain. Nearby crater impacts brought rocks and boulders. The shape became uneven. Gravity did its work. The ramp compressed over time, but it did not compress evenly. Deferring densities shrunk at different rates. Some areas became hard as rock, while others remained as soft as talc. While providing a small average slope into the crater, the ramp itself was rugged and bitterly uneven. On reaching entrance crater, the lone inhabitant of Mars turned his vehicle toward the Schiaparelli Basin. The difficult terrain of the ramp was unexpected, but it looked no worse than other terrain he routinely navigated. He went around the smaller dunes and carefully crested the larger ones. He took care with every turn, every rise or fall in elevation, and every boulder in his path. He thought through every course and considered all alternatives. But it wasn't enough. The rover, while descending down a seemingly ordinary slope, drove off an invisible ridge. The dense, hard soil suddenly gave way to soft power. With the entire surface covered by at least five centimeters Step of back. dust, there were no visual hints to the sudden change. The rover's left front wheel sank. The sudden tilt brought the right rear wheel completely off the ground. This, in turn, put more weight on the left rear wheel, which slipped from its precarious purchase into the powder as well. Before the traveler could react, the rover rolled onto its side. As it did, the solar cells neatly stacked on the roof flew off and scattered like a dropped deck of cards. The trailer, attached to the rover with a tow clamp, was dragged along. The torsion on the clamp snapped the strong composite like a brittle twig. The hoses connecting the two vehicles also snapped. The trailer plunged headlong into the soft soil and flipped over onto its balloon roof, shuddering to an abrupt halt. The rover was not so lucky. It continued tumbling down the hill, bouncing the traveler around like clothes in a dryer. 
After 20 meters, the soft powder gave way to more solid sand, and the rover shuddered to a halt. It had come to rest on its side. The valves leading to the now missing hoses had detected the sudden pressure drop and closed. The pressure seal was not breached. The traveler was alive for now. Chapter 24 The department head stared at the satellite image on the projection screen. Jesus, Mitch said. What the hell happened? The rover's on its side, Mitch said, pointing to the screen. The trailer's upside down. Those rectangles scattered around are solar cells. Venkat put a hand on his chin. Do we have any information on the state of the rover pressure vessel? Nothing obvious, Mindy said. Any signs of Watney doing something after the accident? An EVA, maybe. No EVA, Mindy said. The weather's clear. If he'd come out, there'd be visible footsteps. Is this the entire crash site? Brucing asked. I think so, Mindy said. Up toward the top of the photo, which is north, there are ordinary wheel tracks. Right here, she pointed to a large disturbance in the soil, is where I think things went wrong. Judging by where that ditch is, I'd say the rover rolled and slid from there. You can see the trench it left behind. The trailer flipped forward onto its roof. I'm not saying everything's okay, Bruce said, but I don't think it's as bad as it looks. Go on, Beckett said. The rover's designed to handle a roll, Bruce explained. And if there'd been pressure loss, there'd be a starburst pattern in the sand. I don't see anything like that. Watney may still be hurt inside, Mitch said. He could have banged his head or broken an arm or something. Sure, Bruce said. I'm just saying the rover is probably okay. When was this taken? Mindy checked her watch. We got it 17 minutes ago. We'll get another pick in nine minutes when MGS-4's orbit brings it into view. First thing he'll do is an EVA to assess damage, Beckett said. Mindy, keep us posted on any changes. Lock entry. Sol 498. Hmm. Yeah. Things didn't go well on the descent into Schiaparelli Basin. To give you some indication of how unwell they went, I'm reaching up to the computer to type this, because it's still mounted near the control panel, and the rover is on its side. I got bounced around a lot, but I'm a well-honed machine in times of crisis. As soon as the rover toppled, I curled into a ball and cowered. That's the kind of action hero I am. It worked, too, because I'm not hurt. The pressure vessel is intact, so that's a plus. The valves that led to the trailer hoses are shut. Probably means the hose is disconnected, and that means the trailer junction snapped. Wonderful. Looking around the interior here, I don't think anything broken. The water tanks stayed sealed. There aren't any visible leaks in the air tanks. The bedroom came unfolded, and it's all over the place, but it's just canvas, so it can't have gotten too hurt. The driving controls are okay, and the nav computer is telling me the rover is at an unacceptably dangerous tilt. Thanks, nav. So, I rolled. That's not the end of the world. I'm alive. The rover's fine. I'm more worried about the solar cells I probably rolled over. Also, since the trailer detached, there's a good chance it's fucked up, too. The balloon roof it has isn't exactly durable. If it popped, the shit inside will have been flung out in all directions, and I'll have to go find it. That's my critical life support. Speaking of life support, the rover switched over to the local tanks when the valve shut. Good boy, rover. Here's a Scooby stack. I've got 20 liters of oxygen enough to keep me breathing for 40 days. But without the regulator, which is in the trailer, I'm back to chemical CO2 absorption. I have 312 hours of filters left. Plus, I have another 171 hours of EVA suit CO2 filters as well. All told, that gives me 483 hours, which is close to 20 souls. So I have time to get things working again. I'm really damn close to the MAB now. About 220 kilometers. I'm not going to let something like this stop me from getting there. And I don't need everything to work at top form anymore. I just need the rover to work for 220 more kilometers and the life support to work for 51 more souls. That's it. Time to suit up and look for the trailer. Log entry. Soul 498. Two. I had an EVA, and things aren't too bad. Mind you, they're not good. I trashed three 
solar cells. They're under the rover and Google. cracked all the hell. Um, they might still be able to piss out a few watts, but six, I'm not holding out much hope. Cool, but can I come into this with one extra solar cell? I needed 28 for my daily operations, and I brought 29. 14 on the rover's roof, 7 on the trailer's roof, and 8 on the makeshift shelves I installed on the sides of both vehicles. I tried pushing the rover over, but I wasn't strong enough. I'll need to rig something to get a leverage advantage. Other than being on its side, I don't see any real problems. Well, that's not true. The tow hook is ruined beyond repair. Half of it ripped clean off. Fortunately, the trailer also has a tow hook, so I have a spare. The trailer's in a precarious situation. It's upside down and sitting on the inflated roof. I'm not sure which god smiled down on me and kept that balloon from popping, but I'm grateful. My first priority will be writing it. The longer it puts weight on that balloon, the larger the chances it'll pop. While I was out, I collected the 26 solar cells that aren't under the rover and set them up to recharge my batteries. May as well, right? So right now, I have a few problems to tackle. First, I need to write the trailer, or at least get the weight off the balloon. Next, I need to write the rover. Finally, I need to replace the rover's tow hook with the one on the trailer. Also, I should spell out a message for NASA. They're probably worried. <laughs> Mindy read the Morse code aloud. Roll. Fixing now. What? That's it? Megan said over the phone. That's all he said, she reported, cradling the phone as she typed out an email to the list of interested parties. Just three words? Nothing about his physical health, his equipment, his supplies? You got me, she said. He left a detailed status report. I just decided to lie for no reason. Funny, Beckett said. Be as smart as to a guy seven levels above you at your company. See how that works out. Oh no, Mindy said. I might lose my job as an interplanetary voyeur. I guess I'd have to use my master's degree for something else. I remember when you were shy. I'm space paparazzi now. The attitude comes with the job. Yeah, yeah, Beckett said. Just send the email. Already sent. Log entry. Sol 499. I had a busy day today, and I got a lot done. I started out pretty sore. I had to sleep on the wall of the rover. The bedroom won't work when the airlock is facing up. I did get to use the bedroom somewhat. I folded it up and used it as a bed. Anyway, suffice it to say the wall of the rover wasn't made for sleeping on. But after a morning potato and Vicodin, I was feeling much better. At first, I figured my top priority was the trailer. Then I changed my mind. After taking a good look at it, I decided I'd never be able to ride it by myself. I'd need the rover. So today was focused on getting the rover riding. I brought all my tools along on this trip, figuring I'd need them for the MAB modifications. And along with them, I brought cabling. Once I get set up at the MAB, my solar cells and batteries will be in a fixed position. I don't want to move the rover around every time I use a drill on the far side of the MAB, so I brought all the electrical cabling I could fit. Good thing, too, because it doubles the rope. I dug up my longest cable. It's the same one I used to power the drill that destroyed Pathfinder. I call it my lucky cable. I plugged one end into the battery and the other into the infamous sample drill then walked off with the drill to find solid ground. Once I found it, I kept going until I'd gone as far as the electrical line would reach. I drove a one meter bit, half a meter into a rock, unplugged the power line, and tied it around the base of the bit. Then I went back to the rover and tied off the cord to the roof rack bar on the high side. Sorry. Now I had a long, taut line running okay. perpendicular to the rover. I walked to the middle of the cord and pulled it laterally. The leverage advantage on the rover was huge. I only hoped it wouldn't break the drill bit before it tipped the rover. I backed away, pulling the line more and more. Something had to give, and it wasn't going to be me. I had Archimedes on my side. The rover finally tipped. It fell onto its wheels, kicking up a large cloud of soft dust. It was a silent affair. I was far enough away that the thin atmosphere had no hope of carrying the sound to me. I untied the power line, liberated the drill bit, and returned to the rover. I gave it a full systems check. That's a boring as hell task, but I had to do it. Every system and
and subsystem was working correctly. APL did a damn good job making these rovers. If I get back to Earth, I'm buying Bruce Aang a beer. Well, I guess I should buy all the JPL guys a beer. Beer's for everyone if I get back to Earth. Anyway, with the rover back on its wheels, it was time to work on the trailer. Problem is, I ran out of daylight. Remember, I'm in a crater. I had gotten most of the way down the ramp when I rolled the rover. But the ramp is up against the western edge of the crater, so the sun sets really early from my point of view. I'm in the shadow of the western wall, and that royally sucks. Mars is not Earth. It doesn't have a thick atmosphere to bend light and carry particles that reflect light around corners. It's damn near a vacuum here. Once the sun is invisible, I'm in the dark. Phobos gives me some moonlight, but not enough to work with. Demos is a little piece of crap that's no good to anyone. I hate to leave the trailer sitting on its balloon for another night, but there's not much else I can do. I figure it survived a whole day like that. It's probably stable for now. But hey, with the rover riding, I get to use the bedroom again. It's the simple things in life that matter. So again. Log entry. Soul 500. Why this? When I woke up this morning, the trailer had its hop yet. So that was a good start. The trailer Reset. was a bigger challenge than the rover. I only had to tip the rover. I need to completely flip the trailer. That requires a lot more force than yesterday's little leverage trick. The first step was to drive the rover Yay. to near the trailer. Well then said. came the digging. Oh god, the digging. The trailer was upside down with its nose pointed downhill. I decided the best way to ride it was to take advantage of the slope and roll the trailer over its nose, basically to make it do a somersault to land on its wheels. I can make this happen by tying off the cable to the rear of the trailer and towing with the rover. But if I tried that without digging a hole first, the trailer would just slide along the ground. I needed it to tip up. I needed a hole for the nose to fall into. So, I dug a hole. A hole one meter across, three meters wide, and one meter deep. It took me four miserable hours of hard labor, but I got it done. I hopped in the rover and drove it downhill, dragging the trailer with me. As I hoped, the trailer nosed into the hole and tipped up. From there, it fell onto its wheels with a huge plume of dust. Then I sat for a moment, dumbstruck that my plan had actually worked. And now I'm out of daylight again. I can't wait to get out of this damn shadow. All I need is one day of driving toward the MAV and I'll be away from the wall. But for now, it's another early night. I'll spend tonight without the trailer to manage my life support. It may be righted, but I have no idea if the shit inside still works. The rover still has ample supplies for me. I'll spend the rest of the evening enjoying a potato. And by enjoying, I mean hating so much I want to kill people. Log entry. Soul 501. I started the day with some nothing tea. Nothing tea is easy to make. First, get some hot water, then add nothing. I experimented with potato skin tea a few weeks ago. The less said about that, the better. I ventured into the trailer today. Not an easy task. It's pretty cramped in there. I had to leave my EVA suit in the airlock. The first thing I noticed was that it was really hot inside. It took me a few minutes to work out why. The atmospheric regulator was still in perfect working order, but it had nothing to do. Without being connected to the rover, it no longer had my CO2 production to deal with. The atmosphere in the trailer was perfect. Why change anything? With no regulation necessary, the air was not being pumped. All right, that is the end of our breakdown of the Linear 64. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Whew, let's see. A couple more days of the Martian left. Um, I'll be posting yesterday's live classes later on today as well, so be sure to check those out on YouTube. As always, stay safe and wash your hands. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Take care, everyone.